Ah, uh, what a lad. Well, probably the biggest piece of feedback I get on this podcast is that I don't get enough female lads on the podcast because there's plenty of great ones out there. So I've gone straight to one of the all-time greats. She started off as a professional netballer with the Mystics before being converted to rugby where she instantly made an impact, carving up on the rugby field with both the Black Ferns and the New Zealand Seven side. In 2013, she won the Rugby World Cup, while in that same year she was also named the International Women's Sevens Player of the Year. She's also a Olympic silver medalist and most importantly she is the mother to three beautiful girls and the w- wife to the absolute lad Peter Arkey. She is one of the all-time great stoked to have her on. It is Kayla Arkey. Bonjour, bonjour. Thank you for having me. No, looking forward to it. I was um, flicking through your um, podcast that you've set up, obviously, um, Life on the Sidelines podcast. Very cool um, setup that you've done there. So if you haven't tuned into that and you're listening to that, make sure you go listen to that. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, how, did you, how did you get involved into that? Oh, uh, well, you know, a bit of a language barrier living in France. Um, and one of the other wives, uh, Jada Mielfel, who's, um, shifted over here a couple of years ago, a lot younger, uh, than me and just, yeah, we just spoke about it. Um, she's obviously had it as a, wanted to do it for a while and then she kind of brought it up to me and I said, this was on a Wednesday and then on a Friday went round to her husband's house and, well, their house, me and Peter and, uh, had a few wines and then we launched it live on social. <laughs> Open the door, the boys are like, "You're joking!" I said, "Start resharing it." And they're like, "We're not sharing anything." <laughs> so yeah, within um, two two days, she came with an idea, and on the Friday we actioned it. And um, yeah, we've had a few guests on so far, and yeah, just just this life, I guess, just being over here, having time on our hands, and can't work because of the visas and language barrier, and it just gives us something to do during the day, and and also nice to listen to other women on the sidelines, and hopefully it'll grow something bigger in the months to come and we branch out a bit more so yeah that's what we're doing at the moment or what I'm doing yeah it's, it's so cool because it is such a um unique sort of situation eh? obviously when, when you're in it you know it but um life on the other side having to follow um your man's journey and um move yeah. to wherever they're moving and um pick up a lifestyle wherever wherever you are for um, an unknown amount of time it's um, very unsettling and especially when you've got kids it's um, yeah. there's a lot to it so I know there's so many um, partners of athletes who who can relate to some of those stories that are shared yeah no we've had some good ones so far and I think um, if we can just take something out of everyone that we have on the guests um, both Jared and I have taken a lot away from people um, you know with experienced husbands or not and all around the world at the moment global so no it's exciting um, gives us something to do and nice to hear someone else's story from the sideline that's kind of in it with us to an extent and um yeah hopefully we can keep growing it so reach out to us wags <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'm hoping to capture some of that on this because you you've obviously done it all you've been um the star on the field and now the star off it so i'm um, looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your journey and how you found that so um, but we will get to the start because obviously um you come from a pretty um significant rugby family um I'm, i'd imagine rugby was a huge part of your upbringing yes 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 just sport in general <laughs> um but yeah dad my dad uh, obviously born and raised in waitara in naki a little little town in the naki um both my mum and my dad are from there so easy when it came to family celebrations and christmases all in one one city um and yeah he obviously was a rugby player a league play or league and rugby and then my mum was a netballer and then yeah obviously he couldn't quite crack it in New Zealand so went offshore um with union first and then that didn't quite work in England and then he switched to league um and then mum obviously Luke's five years older than me um and she said well I'm not having a baby in England or a British baby so she flew home had me and then two months two months old flew back to the England and we lived there for seven, seven, eight years. Um, so my childhood memories, everything's the UK. Oh, true. Yeah, raised raised there as little British kids and then moved back in 96. So I think I was like eight, eight or nine. So yeah, my primary school, we moved to Whangaparoa, which is the hibiscus coast north of Auckland. And primary, intermediate and high school down on the shore at Westlake Girls. Um, so yeah, this I wasn't really introduced to sport kind of, you know, from yeah. – from a young age, it was more like schooling and the English way. And it wasn't until we moved back to New Zealand that, you know, Luke and I both got stuck into 
the Kiwi way of sport, rugby and, and netball. So Yeah, interesting. Eh? So yeah. how hard was that move for you? Did you say you're nine years old coming from an English, a proper English yeah. school to probably a little bit more humble Kiwi school, I'd imagine? One of the one thing I remember is all the kids mocking my accent and then asking <laughs> mum and dad why the kids were wearing no shoes. Why would they be feet? Barefoot. <laughs> So I think, yeah, six months we dropped, lost our uh, accents and then, um, yeah, full and swing and, and you know, especially going back home to the Naki and seeing all the cousins and, yeah, and bare feet when it's freezing. I was like, I don't get it, um, especially when we're in the, in the English cold. But yeah, no, it took us about six months to get used to it and then settled back in and haven't looked back since. But I have a lot of memories growing up in England. So being here now is quite cool, but yeah. full circle moment. Um, but yeah. Was sport a massive part of your upbringing, even in England? Like, were you, you and Luke constantly yeah. playing against each other? Or Yeah, um, I guess back then, probably not appropriate now, but we followed, we went to every game. Like, mum was a sport fanatic as well, I think, which is quite cool. Probably how I raised my children as well. But um, every game, like, even sometimes after matches in clubs, sometimes mum would take us out and we'd be asleep under the, under the bars, like, under the tables and clubs, like, Everyone's smoking and drinking, anyone stinks, but like we were brought up and raised around sport um, every weekend. Dad's trainings, you know, sometimes we go to after school and then obviously Luke actually played soccer, um, obviously in England growing up. That was his story. So he was a football player and I used to watch him train and, and yeah, it just annoyed the shit out of him basically at home, um, that <laughs> annoying sister. And he used to wind me up too. So he was five years older than me. So we've got like videos on VCR back in the day of him just annoying me and rocking me up and in the lounge and whatnot, but yeah, he was a soccer player. So between his soccer games and dad's league, um, yeah, I've just been around it from day dot on the sidelines, I guess. So. And then when did your netball start to become pretty serious? At, at primary school, so obviously mum pushed me into to netball uh, and she was my actual coach at primary for Red Beach Primary School. So yeah, and then through the intermediate um, form one, form two, she was my coach um, and then shifted off to high school, which was – we lived on the coast, which is like about 20 minute, 25 minutes from the shore. And basically Luke, dad just chose the best rugby school for him. So not Oriwa College, it was down at Westlake. And then I pretty much followed what was the best high school for netball or the best school um, for me. So to try and keep pushing the netball scene. Um, so yeah, joined up to Westlake as well and um, made top teams at high school and then Dad actually got a coaching gig right in the middle of my fifth form down at Palmy for the, for the Manawa two team. So I actually spent half of fifth, or half of sixth form, a whole of sixth form and half a seventh form in Palmy. Um, and that was a big shift, especially in your teenage years. Yeah. Like you've got established group of friends and sport. My netball is going really well at North Harbour because North Harbour netball age groups. Um, and then yeah, I had to up and leave with mum and dad to Palmy. Um, but I actually had a few friends through some, obviously, netball and playing age groups and meeting other girls. And at that time, Tutor, which has now um, had a change. But back then, there was 12 girls, 12 netballers, um, Yvette, clothes and jewellery, school, 12 netball girls. And I had the choice of either going there and being in a proper netball high school or going to Palmy Girls um, and Mars Gordon, who was a principal at the time, who now is Hamilton Girls Principal, really like one of my second mum. She basically sat mum and dad down and was like, look, she can go to tour and, and learn netball and do, you know, her studies there. But if she comes to Palmy, she can do athletics, she can do yeah. rugby, she can do hockey, like, and have a big variety of friendships. So I went down that avenue. Obviously, mum and dad put me into Palmy and quite a small town. So I played touch um, with everyone and um, a couple of 15s rugby games, roped into a couple of games with Salika Winiata back then. Um, and obviously my netball still continued there with Western and then under 21s and then moved back to Auckland in seventh form, went back to Westlake, finished off school there and netball, um, up in North Islands. And then, yeah. And then kind of went into adult, like prem netball grades. Um, and like, I just, Luke, Luke, my brother's just like a, we're just two different opposites. He's, his training ethic is something else. I just went with through the motions and just sought my talent and just like, I was about social life. My friends, you know, he was the complete opposite. And so my dad really struggled with, I think the both of us were well, not yeah. struggled, but two different, two different children. Um, and looking back, if I had done what he had done, I would, would have been a silver firm, but I just, yeah, I just was too cool. I would try to go to the movies and hang out with mates and just kind of made my way through age groups. And then, 
didn't think I'd be that, like, obviously the soul fans for netball is your dream. That's your goal. And, you know, it's this pretty cutthroat and not political, but you kind of know if you're going to make it and you know if you're not. Um, so then ANZ came about and obviously I used to work as a caterer at some of the force games when it was called NPC and used to just love seeing it. And then that was my goal. And then it shifted to ANZ, which was with the Aussie girls. Um, so that was kind of a goal. And then, yeah, I made, it was a training partner in 2010, I think it was. Um, and then 2011 became a full contracted member for one, one season. I sat behind the world's best player, which, you know, I'm, I'm totally content with, Tima Pada, Um, and I got four minutes on the court in a whole season <laughs> when we were up by 20 goals against the tactics. So, but for me, like, I was just stoked to be around all those girls, like Rhea, Kat, like, just, yeah, I was like, okay, shit, I actually have to work hard and actually put in the effort and, and train harder and, and whatnot. So, and then, yeah, that was 2011, and we actually made it to the final, the grand final over in Brisbane in Queensland, which was... Yeah, unreal experience. I guess, you know, I didn't get on the court, but I trained every day with them. It was semi-professional back then. Um, Are you on the bench ready to go on in these games or do they name a bench? Yeah. yeah. So all these games you're ready. Yeah, <laughs> no, okay. like it's 12. Yeah. I'm on, I warm up, I sit on the bench and then I have to do the duty duties <laughs> afterwards and do running behind the stadium when they're all upstairs doing promos. Yeah. For literally a whole season. Um but I was happy. Like I still worked um, in an admin job, and then I'd go do that as well. Like I was just stoked to be around. All like they were. Yeah. It was a pretty stacked team back then in 2011 for the Mystics. Um, and made the grand final and lost to the Firebirds. But you know, I got to, got a trip over there, and we go to Aussie and do trips and stuff, which was pretty cool. But yeah, um, looking back now, and then the following year, I thought, okay, cool, this is my shot because Tiwa Pata's retiring. Like um, Jenny May's gone, and then I got dropped. So I was like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> So it was between actually Portia and I, me, Portia and Bailey Mears, um, and Debbie Fuller at the time just kind of decided to go for a different pos- positional difference. And Portia was a centre wing D and I was a centre wing attack. And yeah, so they took Portia and then dropped me. True. Were, were you playing well? Did you felt like did you feel like you deserved um, to be dropped? Or well, yeah, because I worked my ass off for a whole season. I didn't complain once. I, you know, I. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a, like a team person, so I would never be you know, not selfish at all. Like I'd always put the team first. I just love being in the environment. You know, just being rubbing shoulders with the with the country's best, probably world's best players too. So I just knew my place, knew my. But I thought that 2012 year, I was like, okay, like I've done my hard yard. I might get a shot with a couple of game, and then positional wise, it just didn't happen that year. And so, um, yeah, I got offered the training partner role, but I was like, I've already done that. I've I've had a taste. I'm not going backwards. So I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. And literally, then like I think it was like two weeks. NZAU came out with a go for gold campaign for seven because now uh, it was an Olympic sport. So it literally was like, I think two or three weeks later, Dad sent me the, the link to the website and I was like, hint, hint, yeah. Because his dream was for me to be, to be a rugby player. Yeah. And I'm like, no, mum and I are like, no, netball, netball, netball. And he's just like, um, but growing up, I didn't, I didn't watch much of the 15s, the Black Fern, or New Zealand, yeah. the 15s back then. I was, because oh, I was netball. Um, I knew Anna Richards, I knew, you know, it's far apart, I knew certain women, but I didn't follow them, I didn't watch the games or World Cups, I, oh, I would watch World Cups, and that's how I first saw Carla Hohepa, um, but yeah, I was like, oh, are you sure, like, read up to it, and I actually, we were still kind of doing club netball at the time, and Portia and I were in the same club for Mags, um, and obviously now she's got this full contract for Mystics, I've been dropped, both of us have dads who are like, you need to go to this trial and have, give it a crack. So we both, because I hadn't said no to Mystics training, she was obviously said yes, and we snuck out one night, it was a six o'clock down at um, Unitech, and it was a trial night, um, so her and I kind of snuck off, she's fully contracted, I'm kind of in between, and went to this trial night, just tackled some tackle bags, did some sprints, running, I think a fitness test, um, which obviously netball is. Rocked up in our tights because netballers wear like <laughs> long tights, and everyone's giving us filthy looks, I'm like, this is, we are not fitting in here. Um <laughs> But with a lot of rugby girls and, and also some other people that like hockey played, like not just rugby, um, cause it was a campaign for just sports women in general. Um, but obviously there's a lot of rugby girls there and we just, yeah, that night I still remember. And then Alan Bunting was the assistant coach, but the, he was running that night in Auckland and yeah, he called me and Portia side and took our names down and can't really remember what happened there. Next minute we made a team that went to Fiji, uh, Oceania tournament and. Yeah, never. And then that happened. And then she had to make the decision, obviously, what she was going to do. I was like, I'm cracking into the sevens. I'm yeah. 
we were not contracted. There was no money involved. It was purely just um, part time at that point, and it was all regional. And did you know you were going to be good? Did you did you feel like you were better than the others? Nah, I was. Nah, you should see. I'm <laughs> the the ruck area is obviously coming. Oh, I for netball and being a non contact sport, I was known for like hip throwing and quite physical on the court. Um, so I didn't have any worry about contact, but it was just the the ruck area where I used to even watching like men's rugby I'm like oh I just would not put my head in that kind of space <laughs> but with sevens I was like oh you know I, I haven't really seen I've watched men's sevens you know watching DJ and all the, the men's sevens a lot more than I have um the women's side of the game so I've seen seven tournaments online so yeah I was like oh let's give it a crack and then but there was quite a lot of there was some hierarchy at the time like Huriana, Manuel, Linda, Tanu, Carla and all the big, big rugby girls and we kind of just came in and they were real welcoming. Like I think um, they'd obviously be behind the scenes pushing this for this for years um, with the NZRU to get this on the Olympic Committee and, you know, they Sevens is different to 15s um, in terms of the game and the speed and whatnot. So they were adamant looking for athletes as well as rugby players for the for the knowledge of the game. But yeah, I kind of thought I knew everything about rugby um, after watching it for how many years. And so <laughs> yeah. I did learn a few things pretty quickly. Um, and then, yeah, my first tournament was in Fiji in 20, 2012 with the girls in August. And Ruby Tui was my roomie and uh, Hazel Tubic, two very hundy girls. <laughs> um, Hazel's like lived and bred rugby and Ruby's just hundies. So I was like, oh, this is awesome. And yeah, like just a whole different scene. and. Um, yeah, obviously Fiji is amazing, beautiful country, and yeah, we won that tournament bit Aussie. And I think I have, I had no idea about, um, I didn't know about the black jersey and what it meant and how, you know, obviously New Zealand rugby's life, um, and it's massive at home and global, globally too. So, but I didn't know how deep it kind of was, um, to some of the older girls and the girls that have been around the, been around the game for a long time. So us newbies, they had to, you know, kind of get us involved in that and talk about the history of the game and the jersey and the women before us and, but also we were a pioneer to a new legacy. The Sevens was, you know, they've had a Sevens team before that's gone to the World Cup, but it was never funded. They were never paid. They went there on their backs. So this is a different kind of um, scenario. So we were also, there is history in it, but also a new, new legacy as well. So Huriana and Linda, they kind of, those older girls made that really special. Um, so it was really cool to be a part of now looking back that we were the pioneers to this Sevens campaign that's still going now pretty strong. So, but the big one for me was I still was like, oh yeah, that was really cool. Um, it was still a bit gumby, but a bit chubby on the side, and had a good tournament. And then it was Dubai was the the World Series, the first leg of the HSBC back then, and I was like, well, this yeah. is pretty serious. That's pretty cool. Like we get to go to Dubai, like we're gonna go to Australia for netball. And I was like, shit, like okay, and because it was still quite new, the management, everyone, like no one really knew where the game was going or what where the where the team was going. It was all really new really new and so they just had a bunch of girls and they pick from and then they take us so went to Dubai um yeah that was that was nuts and then we won that tournament and I remember walking around the stadium with Portia and a couple of other girls at the end and just because we alongside the men obviously that series um and we played before the men's final so our final we beat Aussie Aussie or something yeah I think it was Aussie then we walked around the crowd and did like a lap. And I was just like, this is so like cool, but also uncomfortable because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we're like waving to the crowd. And then I just remember one corner was like the Kenyan fans that were just going crazy in the crowd. I was like, this yeah. is like a party. I was like, what even is this? And then that's when I looked at Portia and I was like, I'm staying with this. I'm not going back to netball. And she kind of looked and was like, fuck, oh, this is unreal. Like, so she had a big decision. I kind of was like, my, my mind's set. Like, I'm going to, going to roll with this and give it a good crack. And, yeah, it just flowed on from there. It just got bigger and bigger and the tournaments, the world rugby, the other nations. We were well ahead of everyone, um, you know, in terms of skill set just and just the game, uh, the knowledge of the game. But now, obviously, it's pretty on par with every nation's with the resources and two two Olympic cycles. But, yeah, like at the start, it was Olympic Olympic sport and that's why I chose to convert. But also, like, well, netball is not happening for me. The door's shut. It's not shut. I can go back. But I'm like, I've, I'm... 24 now 25 yeah. like you kind of know if you're going to be a silver fern at 25 or not like <laughs> so I was like that's gone like I'm not going to be a silver fern and so this kind of popped up and yeah in 2013 it kind of got quite serious and we were on you know four world series tournaments and it's grew and grew and grew and then obviously yeah ups and downs in those four years and then 
I obviously met Peter in 2013 um, in a very famous club out west, Auckland, Hangar Bar. Oh, no doubt. So obviously I was quite full on with work and training and I had no, you know, like we'd have, also we were quite quite a little party group back then, uh, <laughs> us girls, um, would have Sunday sessions and because we weren't fully contracted. So How did the contracts work? Oh, um, I don't even... So 2012, 13, end of 14 or 15. Oh, yeah, like we'd been speaking about it, but the big thing was the centralization. You'd have to actually, to make, to make us full time, you have to centralize us. And so not, not at that time, women, girls yeah. didn't want to move because we still had jobs because we had to have a job. Didn't want to move unless you could pay us full, full time. Was that the same for you with netball and rugby? Both of them were only sort of part time. You still had to have a job. Yeah. Unless you're a silver fern because you also got a silver fern salary as well oh, okay. as the mystics where well, I was just mystics and. So you'd have a, yeah, a lot of girls studied, but I was out and I, I work. So, mm. but yeah, that was another reason, another cool thing to be a part of and making sure that was all. Um, but at that time, none of us paid, like played for that. I had a full-time job still and could go to trainings before work and after work. And you know, I had a pretty good employee. So an understanding and the girls, a lot of girls studied. So, and we weren't there for the money. We knew that was never going to come unless we, you know, that was going to happen down the track. But in 2012, 13, 14, we just had to keep winning keep growing the game and then the NZR would deal with that when it comes to push comes to shove and obviously after the Olympics. So yeah, I think after the Olympics was when they centralized full time and decided it was time to new cycle. A lot of us were kind of finished and then they yeah made a centralization in the Mount, Mount Monganui. So yeah. yeah, but I met Peter in 2013 um, at a bar, didn't know who he was. Um, I knew his friends. I was like, I haven't seen you around this round before. And then he literally was like, oh, yeah, I play rugby too. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then um, kind of texted me and he kind of said, oh, yeah, I'm going down to the Mount next week. I've got a trial for the sevens. It's like, what's that? You play sevens? And he's like, yeah, I'm going down for the World Cup oh, yeah. Russia trial for sevens. And I'm like, oh, nah. Because he was playing Harbour at the time, ITM. And I said, oh, I, I am too, because I play sevens too kind of thing. And it was just real weird. And I remember Googling him being like, he's only 20 years old and I was 24. And I was like, he looked way older at the time. I was like, you did not you just turned 21 and I was 24. And then, yeah, and then a couple of weeks later, we were just chatting and then he ended up in the mount. I'm in the mount and we're having like, yeah, a World Cup Russia trial, so 2013. And he went for the men's and I was going for the girls. And yeah, and then he made the team. Um I made the team, but we're kind of still just getting to know each other. And then we're in Russia together. Um, they won. We won. It was just <laughs> like um, number one alcohol in Russia's vodka. So, yeah. Um, and then came home, celebrated, and, yeah, pretty much made it official together, yeah, in, end of 2013. How good is that? Fell in love in Russia. Yeah, well, yeah, I just – I had my doubt. Like, rugby players, to me, I'm kind of like, look, I've just – it's just not going to work like we're both you – know, yeah. I just didn't see it. It was going to be quite tough, and but then you can't can't help who you fall in love with. So I was like, okay, well, and he was doing really well. Like he was up and coming. He was playing ITM, um, you know, New Zealand Sevens, and then obviously Supers. He was with the Blues wider at the time, which I was like, he'll get a Blues full contract. So yeah, and then it kind of happened in 2014. He went to the Com Games as well, and I was just like, it's crazy. So we made it work um, with my traveling, and yeah, and then obviously kind of support each other a lot through it all, and then. Um, yeah, kind of in honeymoon phase, I'd call it. <laughs> but everything was all going well because we were living yeah. in Auckland. He was doing blues. I was I was at the Millennium training on the shore and everything worked out. We lived together because Dad's like, live it, move together now and l- find out quick if you can get along or not. Like, go live together. Yeah. Go, go move in together. So I was like, <laughs> the hell, Dad? So he was like, move in together. See if, you know, don't fuck around and don't waste time. So, and then, yeah, we did. Um, and, yeah, back in 2014 and then – he had a really good season for the Blues back then, that one season, and um, with JK, the coach. And then, yeah, kind of, I think he got a pro- – yeah, obviously the Hurricanes came knocking in 2015 because um, the Blues were just coaching, didn't know what was happening there. And then he signed with the Hurricanes for two years, which didn't really affect me because then I just moved to Wellington and then I just regionally jumped to Wellington because we still at that time were all regions. Mm. Um, and they had resources down there because there was three other Wellington girls, Kat Futter Simpkins, Amanda Rash. Um, so we, I just jumped in with them. They've got a high performance centre there on the waterfront of Miramar. So I just, nothing phased me. And I still was travelling with the team and I was doing my training outside of there. So that actually worked well as, as well. So, um, so all was going well. And then, yeah, did Rio and, um, how was Rio? How was it? Oh, it was awesome. Um, 
yeah, it was it was nuts. I don't even even know how to explain. It. Like, I, obviously, there was it was kind of shit in terms of like the the the, re, the, the facilities and that because things weren't finished. And we were the village, New Zealand village, was at the end of the whole place by the transport. So like, they all the flash ones apartments were at the top with USA, and then they kind of got like less and less and less, <laughs> like no windows, no plumbing. So we were like in that, but we're close to the transport station, so. But nothing phased us. Our team had been through every up, down, everything in between, and women. We just got on with it. So, but like, just yeah, see, being amongst athletes, and obviously, the first couple of days we were just trying to find famous people, and then we're taking photos with like, I remember some Jamaican chicks in the eating the food hall, and I was like, I don't know who they are, but they're obviously famous. So we'll just grab a photo of them. <laughs> I was like, they're probably sprinters. So we had a photo of these random chicks. It's just workers. And then they had this thing, yeah, um, where you have the pin, you have a pin, and like an Olympic thing is you try and swap badges or pins with people. Um, oh, yeah. And that's kind of what everyone kind of does. And yeah, I think I, I think it was, um, I think it was Venus and we went up to her and I finally got my moment. So I was like, um, yeah, we tried to find Serena and Venus the whole time. Cause I was like, oh, I'm just idols. And she on her Instagram or it might've been Snapchat or something. said she was at the park and it was just up in the middle of our thing. So we all raced there and she was gone. So we missed her. <laughs> And then the other girl saw her at dinner time and got photos of her and I missed that. And then Venus was walking out of the food court and I was like, this is my one shot. I'm just going to do it. We went up to her and I literally looked at her. I was like, do you want to swap badge? And she was like, I already have a New Zealand one. <laughs> 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 oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. But I was like, I, I had a conversation with her. I said, do you want to swap badges? And she's like, I've already got one. So I was like, oh. But just being around like, yeah. Get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like she looked at me and she spoke to me and we had dialogue. But she didn't I didn't get a badge but her pin. But um and, and then obviously with the whole New Zealand team as well, um, because we were in so much in our own knit with women men's and women's sevens, um, being a part of a bigger team and group that was pretty special. Um, you know, being around Valerie, who we, we obviously trained with her up in Auckland, but just being around her and her tournament mode and all the other athletes the rowers and just the clubhouse and what the New Zealand team does and our culture like every welcoming there'd be a porphyry or a haka and other teams would come out of their apartments and just watch like um yeah just want to see every, every, every country does things differently and for me that was probably the biggest thing was being in a bigger team and other sports and and I just couldn't wait for our once our event was over and we'd finished to go and watch the other athletes. So we actually went and watched Luca um, with her canoeing, which I have never watched prior to the Olympics, and went and watched her live and she won a medal. And I was just like, yeah. I think afterwards, obviously the Olympics and once our focus and our job was done, I couldn't wait to go watch the other athletes and support them like they were all supporting us. But yeah, it just the food court, the food, like everything's what people say is real. It just was nuts. Um mm an experience that I've just yeah very lucky and privileged to have been part of and then yeah what do you remember about your final obviously you didn't quite get the gold that you probably were dreaming of but a silver medal what do you remember about that game yeah no I thought um we did like we were building every game um obviously it was two games a day so that obviously kind of levels out the playing field a, a, a bit more only having two and it was obviously dragged on a bit more but it was for me it was a it was a 20 minute final back then um and that used to piss me off because we, yeah, different training regimes, different trainer at the time. Um, but I don't think we were as fit as we could have been. And I knew that obviously it, it does make a difference, a 10 minute half compared to seven, especially when you're playing all the other five games at 14 minutes and you jump to a final and it's the last game and you're playing 20, which is usually like 22 minutes. Um, yeah. that for me was like, oh, this is, it's a whole, it's a massive game changer. So literally after Rio, they took that out and made it seven minutes the finals which broke me but I think if it had been 14 it would have been a different story but in saying that um we yeah we tried we got yeah it just wasn't meant to be that night and Aussie just came out firing and um yeah pretty guttering um but in saying that I was I was proud I was like um we've just won a medal which didn't probably took about two years to sink in um we came home did all the solitary around the country and and all the, that stuff but as a player, it's like, yeah, it's silver, but I was like, could have been a gold. And it wasn't until some, I think, I don't know who told me, or someone said to me, like, there's 10, 11,000 athletes, and some people don't even get on the podium at all. So mm. it might even be Val. Someone just said, like, look, girls, it's, it's a massive, you're on the tally chart, and you've got a medal, which some yeah athletes go, and they prep for four years, eight years, heaps of years, and they don't even get on the podium. Like, um, yeah, yeah. so when that was said, I kind of was like, okay, be, be grateful now, Kayla, like you've got a silver medal and it's something to be proud of. Um, 
But yeah, so I have not actually watched the game. I've never watched that final back yeah. ever. Um, never watched it. I've tried to. No. Nah. So um, yeah. And then obviously I had a burning desire. Obviously had to move off offshore from New Zealand. And how hard was that for you? Because that's a that's obviously a huge commitment when you're in your prime. You've just come off an Olympic game, and now you've got to um, sort of step down. Well, decided to have a baby first. Decided decided to be a mum. <laughs> so I had like Peter and I obviously spoke about kids, and my goal was Rio. And then he said, "Well, what happens after Rio? You know, there's another four years before the next Olympics, um, but two years for Com Games, mm. which was in first Com Games um, post the Olympics uh, in 2017." So I, him and I and our families all kind of spoke and I said, look, well, I've done the Pinnacle event. I've ticked my big box. I've worked my ass off for four years. I've done it. I've got a silver. Let's try for a family. And if it comes you know, quicker than expected, great. Then I can try and make it back. But that was another whole, um, another whole killer fish because um, I'm not the fittest person. All my girls around me that know me, all rugby players know me, that I wasn't the fastest Bronco. I wasn't. I ended up singles, yes, but continuous, maybe not. Um, so like for, for me, um, and in the gym, I'm not really a big gym kind of person, but I'll just you know, tick boxes and do the gym because the trainer wants you to do the gym and do weights. Um, cause I had like a thing about looking big. I always had this body image about, I guess probably dating Peter didn't really help. I didn't want to be seen like, Oh, dude, it's just rugby. There's just a stigma around masculinity and just looking big. And I just, I just didn't want to, yeah, something was in my head about that. So I just didn't want to look like that. And so I used to be like, I don't want to do weights. I don't lift heavy. And the trainers would be like, oh my gosh, like it's for the game. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can play. I don't need to lift big weights. Like I need to get faster and fitter. And so I was always having constant battles with our trainers being like, I want to be faster and fitter. And they were like, you need to be stronger and fast. Like just, yeah. <laughs> so that was a headache for four years. But um, yeah, so post 2016, me, Peter and I decided that we'd, you know, try and have a baby and then literally happened pretty quickly after Rio how supported are you in that decision? Like, um, have you got pressure from coaches? Have you, like, obviously your coaches probably want you to stay playing for them, but ha- yeah, how supported are you in that? Well, Sean Horan, who was a coach at the time, left, um, and then Alan Bunting, the assistant coach, um, I actually had a conversation with him because he was his next step in, like, he went, obviously went up into, um, to the head coach. And I, just, I just, just had a conversation with him and said, look, like, I've, I want to be a mum. I'm 28 now, like, I'm getting older and, if I'm going to try and come back for the next cycle, um, I need to kind of move quickly now and, and get back in time because, or well, who knows, who knows? And he said, yep, go here. My, he gave me his full support. He's, you know, he's an awesome, awesome guy. And it's, obviously you can tell now the way he's still, still in there and, and making massive changes in the women's game. But it was just him and I had a conversation. I had his full support. That's all I needed because he's a national coach. Um, provincials, provincial, and that chops and changes. But he was like, totally go for it, Kay. Like, um, and pretty much supported me along the way. But the bigger thing there was that we obviously had contracts in place and memorandums, what they call them back then, not quite a full contract, but there was no clause whatsoever for maternity leave or even how to deal with pregnancy. Oh, wow. Um, so I was like, okay. Um, so Rob, Nicole, and I are best friends. Um, so for me, I fell pregnant straight away, like literally within two months, I think it was straight away, which was cool. Um, so that happened and um, – yeah, I had a lot of meetings with the New Zealand Players Association because um, it was a whole new territory for NZR mm. um, and NZRPA. Obviously, netball has a clause and hockey players have a clause, but there was nothing for the female side in rugby. So it was new territory, which I'm quite cool to be a part of and be a part of something new and, and help with sorting that all out and pinning that to paper and, and um, being a part of that, which is really special. And then um, in saying that, it also – Drove me to try and come back quicker after having, well, I don't know, my pregnancy, I was OCD. I was walking every day. I was like, I'm coming straight back after I've had her. I'm coming straight back into the environment. Um, I was, yeah, really like I'm coming back to try and prove a point and also lay a foundation for other women um, in New Zealand and globally that you can have a baby and come back because no one's done it. So no one had ever done that before? No one had had a baby? Not in the sevens. Wow, okay. Fifteens, yes. Yeah. Because um, Pango, Renee Whitcliffe um, was the first person, you know, she had a baby and was back running in six weeks um, to one of our camps. Um, so, yeah, Renee Whitcliffe is the only one I know personally in New Zealand. Um, and obviously there's Carla Horhepper and – and other women, but I think fully contracted because in 2017 we were fully contracted now and it's full time. Mm. So you, um, you know, those get, we didn't have contracts back then. So it's kind of like, well, NZR could be like, come back when you've, you know, got to prove yourself. Like, 
Yeah. So yeah, I had her really good uh, pregnancy. Uh, went quickly. Everything was good. Birth was great. Great midwife in Wellington. And I remember you know, she was a really chill baby. Like couldn't have asked for any better. She slept. I had to wake her to feed her. She <laughs> slept. She was just amazing baby. Never cried. So I was like, oh, okay, well, this is all new to me. So I was like, okay, call Bunce. And I was like, okay, well, she's three months old now. He's like, whoa, whoa, chill. And I was like, no, no, she's three months old. Life's great. I want to get back into it. And then that, um, Peter, obviously, uh, Supers is Wellington, but ITM was North Harbour. But then he signed with Waikato. So we actually had to move up to Hamilton to live with um, our family friend, Mars Gordon, at her house. And I went back to the back training. She was three months old. Um which meant that I got paid again because for me, I was like, I don't have no income. I had the maternity leave from the government, which was awesome. And obviously that was quite cool. That was all written in the plan. Um, but for me, I was like, I want to get back in training and get my pay again. So yeah, I did that, jumped in with the girls in Hamilton and um, started back training with a goal to go to Australia in August. Uh, I think she would have been four months. So we went to Australia when she was four months old. I didn't play in the tournament, but just got you know back to running with Brad Anderson, who – is unreal. Like another reason why I came back and was so comfortable because he's, you know, Tiana and I with his wife's, you know, they had a baby and he's, he's just an awesome guy really, you know, mm. about the athlete. So he helped me and it was a new territory for a few people and just, you know, treated it with, with caution, but also I was like, I know my body, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, so no one really knew what happened, but um, first era was, I came back in Hamilton and it was MAS, which is high intensity max speed. <laughs> And I was still breastfeeding at this because I was like, oh, I really know what's happening and no one really knew and I had really no advice. And I remember doing sprints, MAF, and then that afternoon I couldn't walk. My ankles were just like seizing. I was like, what the fuck is happening? So I remember ringing the physio, like, I don't know what's happening. My ankles are like all, yeah, blocked up and just, and then we found out through um, research that <laughs> um, when you are breastfeeding, you have relaxed muscles. And so my <laughs> not supposed to be having, so literally that afternoon off, off the boob, sell it on the bottle that night and she was straight on the bottle, took it like a champ, no issues there. So yeah, so little things like that, learning along the way and obviously feeding that back to them, you know, to the sevens admin and feedback. And so, yeah, and then Aussie, she was four months old. And then my big goal was Dubai 2017, back on the world circuit after having a baby. Um, and I pushed, you know, worked my ass off with the help of the girls around me, the team, the management were unreal. Peter, my family, um, and with this going on, Peter also had no supers contract for 2017. So obviously the, the teams are announced around October, September, October now, uh, October, November. So with this all happening and me returning back and doing my thing, my mate on the side didn't know what was happening in his rugby. Um, oh, calm down. So we unknown for him, but for me, I was like, I've, you know, I've got my goal. I'm going back in. I'm going to make make a statement and and you know and, and get back out there with Stella alongside me which is just my goal my dream while well, he was struggling playing for Waikato no supers contract didn't know what was going to happen and was like oh shit um okay I was like, look I'll go to Dubai I'll, I'll try and make that team and I did so in December she was eight months old flew business to Dubai here is Stella eight month old in business class living <laughs> her best life um Obviously, part of the agreement with NZRPA and NZRU was the support help. So my mum, they have a support person now until the oh, baby's oh, one. Yeah. Oh, so mum got to fly over. Yeah, f- fly over. And it was all funded with NZRPA and NZR um, in terms of player pool payment. And they figured that all out financially. And yeah, until the baby, you know, there's a it's written in there now until the baby's one, you can have a support person at all times and camps, travel and may have changed now. But so mum flew over and got to come and experience that and saying the JW Marriott Twin Towers, um, <laughs> living our best lives um, in Dubai. But we had a week, obviously, in Abu Dhabi, which um, John looks after us over there, the team, off his back. And so we had a week in Abu Dhabi. She was, you know, living her best life. And then we came across to Dubai and played that tournament. And, yeah, I made it back on the field. Um, we obviously dropped out short in the quarters and lost um, to USA. But for me, it was a bigger picture and – it actually had other nations talking, so I had a couple of the Aussie girls come to me, Shani um, and Shannon Perry, asking me about, you know, what's written in the in the contracts because they're going through that at the moment and girls wanting to have babies. And um, the Fijian girls are just, like, coming and grabbing Stella and just taking her off. And, yeah, I had a lot, a lot of talk was happening around the actual mm. nations and who's who's paying for her mum, who's paying for the baby. Like, a lot of talk was happening, which is what I – it's good talk. So that was all happening, which was quite cool and – yeah, so hope I kind of helped, um, hopefully helped 
with that situation um, and other unions about helping out women and babies. And so, yeah, got made it back to Dubai, sellers on the sidelines, um, staff, um, girls, really welcoming, cool having her on tour because she was so chilled. And then while this was happening, Peter was, you know, got no contract, but got a gig in Connacht oh, uh, in right. Ireland yeah, yeah, yeah. where Bundy, Bundy and, um, Bundy and Kayla are, are key. So that was a big pull draw card for Peter, like, well, Bundy's there and they're set up and um, I'm just going to go as a medical joker for Connick because, uh, uh, what's his name, the coach? Kieran Kane, was it? Yes, yeah, Kane. He was a coach and obviously knew Peter from age groups and stuff, so he actually was over there while I'm still doing the seven. So he went up in October, was playing for Connick um, as a medical joker, so you're not really, you yeah. don't know what's happening. Um, and so I just was like, look, yeah, did Dubai. It was on high of life. Like, yep, next year's Com Games, 2017's Com Games. Um, and obviously we had a wedding as well in the middle of all that in the December, the next month in 2017, got married. He flew back. The team released him. We got married. And then he just pretty much, we just decided that um, he's like, I can't do this without you and Stella. It just, he's just a family man and he needs his girls. So, yeah, wasn't, yeah, it was kind of, I just, again, uh, spoke with Bunce and said, "Look, this is the situation. Peter's, you know, the, the bread earner. It's his, you know, it's his career. And I'm a mum and a wife. And now, you know, that's his daughter. So I want to go over there and support him, get him settled until he knows what's happening long term, like in terms of contracting, because we don't know what's happening. He's got to play. He's like full support. Where you go? And that was really tough because, mm. especially for my family, because that meant I missed out on the Com Games uh, that following following year, and that was a tough one to pill to swallow. But I'm like, for me, I've done everything. It, it sucked, but I'm like, I." have a child and a husband and going to go support him. So I'd, at the time I was like, oh, it is what it is. Um, actually got a wedding present from Connick to go to the Ashford Castle and for a honeymoon and I ended up watching the girls win the Com Games from a lavish castle in Ireland. So I was like, <laughs> could be worse. I'm crying on the bed being like, could be there, but this is pretty special. And um, yeah, and then the Connick kind of didn't really eventuate. Um, may obviously moved there, Galway, English speaking, Galway, Awesome city, um, cool bunch of girls. I actually Bundy coached a women's team there, Galwegians, and he's like, "Okay, sis, so if we're gonna if you're gonna come live with us for a month, I need you to come and you know play for this women's team." And I was like, "No, I'm, I've just had a baby and I need to just chill out." <laughs> so no, I go down and go to trainings, and he's not even there. So six o'clock, and bearing in mind I don't play 15s, so and I play a summer se- sevens a summer. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go jump in this training with Irish, a bunch of Irish girls, 6 p.m. in the middle of winter, December. I was like, well, I don't even know what to wear because, you know, seven, we just wear shorts. And I remember going to the first training because we were staying at the Connick Hotel next door to the fields. And I come home and I had like Ruth, I think her name's Ruth, one of the English, uh, Irish props. I'm a World Cup prop. Like a bit fishy with me because I was like, oh, like they're like, oh, this New Zealand women's sevens player is coming to our training. I was like, oh, I don't play 15s. Like it's not me. Like don't even say anything. Don't even mention that because I don't, I don't play 15s. So I go into the, the set. Peter's at home with Stella after his training, six or eight. And basically she picked up the ball and just ran it straight at me and just ran straight <laughs> over me. I was just like, I was like, fuck you. Okay, let's go. And then I was like, oh, and then I got angry because of people that know me, I get angry. And so I was just like, oh, and she did it again. It was like a little four corner, a little four square drill. Uh, two on one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she just was, wasn't even, she just was like, just running at me. I was like, fuck. So I had to tackle this. I do not tackle Big Mum. Like I was, she was a big girl <laughs> prop for Ireland, Ruth. Yeah. And then the second time she did it, and I just went, I was like, I don't know what I'm, closed my eyes, tackled her. And then she's like, <laughs> and that was it. I got her respect. And so I was like, gone back. I was crying in the shower. I was like, I had freaking mud everywhere. I was like, oh, what are you making? Fuck you, Bundy. Like, and but from that night on the girls like it just it made me it kind of yeah helped me get over the fact that I was missing all my girls back here in New Zealand and playing with the sevens and this is the best I'm going to get in terms of making new friends mm-hmm. and a new this could be our new, new team we don't know so I just you know try to jump into community rugby and cool bunch of girls played a few games and obviously Sini Naupu was from had a few years there and she was up in Dublin now at the time it was giving me shit so yeah, a lot of Kiwis are in Ireland too, so that was quite cool. And then obviously Peter didn't didn't get recontracted, and then he played a game against because uh, obviously they have the, the two competitions, and he had a Euro game against Toulouse. Um, and next minute we were, we were like, "Fuck, we're you know we're going back to New Zealand. Um, I'll go back to the sevens. And he didn't know where his rugby career was at. Literally, like it was just it was devastating because he pretty much he couldn't even make the fifty 
you have the super mm. squads and then you have the 50 wider squad. He couldn't even make that in that November. And I just was like, he was like, what, 20, 23, 20, like 20. I think the hurricanes just, he just didn't play in two years. He had played like maybe a couple of minutes cause he had shoulder, shoulder, like just fucking niggles. Just then he chose the sevens and then Titch didn't pick him for the Olympics. That's another whole story. Um, when him and Kurt should have been there. So that was another, that was a fuck up and just, so he was in a real, real rut, just nothing's happening. And he's, yeah, it was pretty sad. And, and then all of a sudden my brother gets a message from Hugo Moller, which was a Toulouse head coach. True. Um, you know, we've heard that Peter Aki is your brother-in-law. Um, what's the situation with him at Connick? We've seen him play. And so literally it was like a message to Luke yeah. and Luke messages us. And I'm like, I obviously know French rugby and how it works with Luke, but Peter had no idea. Um, and at this stage, he's got nothing. Oh, we're going back to New Zealand. I'm going back to sevens. Um, and we were like, oh, so we didn't. So there was just talks back and forth, back and forth. Connick was finished, um, done. So we went back to New Zealand. Um, in, I think it was May, end of May, the season was, and still talking back and forth with the agents with Toulouse. And yeah, got a two year deal with Toulouse in 20, for 2018 June. Far um, out. thanks, Luke. Which was just, <laughs> yeah, which was nuts because he had just, that was his, he was in Clermont. Obviously, he's, you know, played in Toulouse and won a championship top 14 with Toulouse. And he was up in Clermont at the time and that was his last year. So he actually had a house in Toulouse. He's like, well, I'm, I'm retiring and finishing here. So I'll come hang out with you guys for a bit and get you guys sorted and plant your feet. And it just, it just spun around so quickly to like, we come home, we didn't know what was happening. We had Stella's first birthday in May, didn't telling family we didn't know what we're doing. And then boom, next minute we're flying in two weeks, we're flying to Toulouse and Peter starting in June. Yeah. How stressful and unsettling is all that for you? Yeah. It was just like, yeah, well, at the time I was like, Oh, this is, yeah, it was all over the show. Um, but I was pregnant at the time, so I was pregnant with our second child. So was this another decision you had to to make? Because obviously you're oh. still thinking you were still talking about potentially coming back to New Zealand and playing. Yeah, well, I got pregnant in in that Feb. So when we were in Connacht, oh. I fell pregnant with the second one. So I was like, well, rugby's off the books for twelve months for me. So, um, so for me, I was like, shit. Well, we don't know what we're doing. So when the Toulouse came up, we're like, we're going, we're going. Um, and there's another whole. So in that, got here in June, um, he'd obviously come over from Connick and had like a medical done when he was playing for mm. Connick, um, snuck over um, from Ireland and did his, did his uh, medical here. Um, yeah, so that was another whole story. And then they signed him. And then when we um, kind of had a bit of an issue, because when he did his medical, he missed his first his connecting flight from Germany to Toulouse. And that was the day he was supposed to go to the hospital and get the actual scans and everything done on your body. Mm. Um, but because he was playing rugby, they're like, oh, you must be fine. Everything's good. Sign the contract. And then on the Friday when he's finished, they were like, oh, we've seen your scans and we've, we don't really like what's happening with some parts of your body. Um, we don't really want you. <laughs> so it was just like, um, Roller coaster. we've gone from in one week going to Toulouse to then our agent being like, oh shit, they've, um, decided to just do a mm. reverse on you. How did he reverse the reversal? Um, our agent said, well, they, They've signed the document. You've signed the document. So by court of law, you are going to Toulouse and you, you're you going. Oh, wow. So they basically cut the contract in half, the salary in half, and gave him a one year. So we're like, well, we've got nothing else. Um, Luke's house is there. Luke's there. <laughs> it's like, let's just go and give it a shot. So we came over in the June. Um, uh, for Peter, for me, this is why I get really emotional on, on where he's looking back on when he came. So bearing in mind he's had nothing, not wanted, um, did his dig, did his gig in Connick, playing really well, but not wanted there because he wasn't the future. So they didn't play him alongside Bundy. Another drama. Um, idiot. So yeah, got to Toulouse, uh, oh, June, July, August, September. No one really spoke to him in terms of the management. He wasn't playing. Um, I'm pregnant at the time and I'm trying to just be like, look, it's summer, like just, just, you know, just, and basically, there's an Espoirs team, so it's like their academy mm. um, underneath the pros. So he's a top 14 contracted player and paid, but they weren't playing him because just those ones, emotionally, like, you know, we, we didn't want you, but now yeah. you're here because you have to be here because legally. So he literally had cold shoulders. He, But my cousin was also here, Jared Poy, my first cousin as well, which is another cool thing, having him here. Um, and he was Espoirs because he's a lot younger and, so basically Peter being Peter and me being me and our family being like, fuck, you need to play rugby. Cause we knew when six nations came 
and half of that back line for Toulouse were all going to be off to France, mm. that's when he'd get a shot to prove himself. So um, for me, luckily being in the New Zealand environment and having mentalists and coping mechanisms about dealing with just shit and just being down, that was probably the, the big thing for me was turning from um, player athlete mode to being a supportive wife and trying to help him through one of the most, you know, he had a contract, we were getting paid monthly, but he wasn't playing mm-hmm. weekly. So he was training his ass off Monday to Friday and then not playing. And, uh, and it happened. And then this, obviously this Espoirs is under 25s, I think, but you can have dispensation for two players older, like usually like DuPont, for example, after his first ACL, he came back and played in the Espoirs game before he went yeah. back to the pros. So it's kind of used as a game, like a stepping stone yeah. gateway. But Peter, yeah. So Peter turned around to the club and was like, well, if you're not going to play me, I didn't play rugby. I'm going to play Espoirs. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa like, uh, it's just not a good look. Um, cause you, you're a pro and we don't really want that. And he turned around and I was like, we were both were like, you fuck. Like he's, he's playing. He needs to play. He needs, he needs match fitness. Cause we know that come, I think it was around November, October, November, when the Six Nations kicks on, he, he's going to get a shot. So he did that and credit to him. He would go train with the pros and then he'd turn up to weekends and play what I wouldn't even call club rugby. I would pretty much call it i don't even know in terms of back to new zealand it yeah really frustrating but he you know he got his fitness did his tackling match fitness is you know for rugby players know that's another whole you know thing you've got to keep up so he kept playing you know i had my our second baby camille um in november and i literally had her he was also also sometimes like the 24th man for the top team so he would train go to a game and then warm up and as you know then sit in the stands and watch mm. mystics vibes Oh yeah, I was like, "You've got this." I was like, "Just keep." I was like, "You're going, you're going," because you never know there could be a hamstring in the warm up, and you're playing. Like I was real, like, "No, you're going." Yeah. And as much as it hurt, you know, as much as it was a struggle for him, I was like, "Because that one shot, I know it's going to come." And then I had, um, I was going into um, having my second child, and it was a game in Poe, and he was the 24th man because Zach Holmes was carrying a little niggle, and he went to Poe, which is two hour drive from here, and I went into labour, and he's like, "Oh, I'll come back." I was like, "No, no, no, no." If Zach's not 100, you need to stay there because, you know, you might get on the field. And so I, thanks to having Carl Axtons, a Bay Penny boy, and his wife, Aroha, who's Kelly Brazier's sister-in-law, all family ties, um, ended up coming with me to the hospital, being my side, my, my, uh, four o'clock she was born and the boys were on the bus to the game and she ran Carl and Peter sitting beside each other on the bus and here's your daughter, Camille. So I gave him birth and he's driving to the game. Um, did the warm up and Zach played the game. Oh. <laughs> so Peter sat in the stands, Man. but the manager drove him. The manager drove him straight home back to Toulouse and um and didn't watch the match. Drove him straight back and got him into the hospital. And then Carl rocked up later and we had beers and they were having beers. Sorry in the hotel. And, but then the next day wakes up at eleven a.m. goes and plays for Espoirs on the Sunday. Far oh, out. That's commitment, eh? Like I was like Peter, get up. Where you go? Go play your game. He says, I've had some beers and Camille. I was like, I'm in the hospital. Can't go anywhere. In France, you have to stay for three days. So off you go. And he went and played the Espoir game that afternoon. Like just his mindset. And then sure enough, um, yeah, I think it was November, oh no, December. Um, they had a Clermont away game and all the boys were out. Like Rom- Roman Intimac was a 12 at the time for Toulouse. So he was Peter's position. Um, Roman Intimac was 12. Toma Ramos was 10. So he had a pretty stacked midfield in front of him, and but I, you know, you just keep going, keep going, and even Luke, knowing with Six Nations and how long that is for the boys, and yeah, so he got a shot for Clermont. Um, uh, the game against Clermont, we actually drove up there with um, the girls, and watched. I sat in the hotel when he played the game with friends that were over, and he had an absolute blinder. Um, set up the winning try with Max Madard, um, and uh, then he was like starting every week, and then it was like, oh. Well, the French boys are going to come back now, uh, going into that new year in 2019. And, um, yeah, he was all of a sudden the starting 12 still. And then they pushed Roms to 10, kind of flicked him across to 10 and 12. And, um, you know, and yeah, his body was totally fine. No niggles, shoulders, knees, everything was fine. He was just playing out of his skin. And, um, then fast forward to that June, they won the top 14. Yeah. Crazy, eh? What a story! Hey, <laughs> I'd actually gone. I'd actually gone home. I'd gone home because my you know, for, for family reasons, and um, I remember sitting and watching. My nana was sick, and I went home, and I missed the. Mm. Obviously, Luke has been here when they've won it, and uh, the French are just something else. And he, that for me, seeing him with my family in the Naki, um, and watching him win that game against um, Clermont, and 
just him going back to the Toulouse afterwards, the parade for the town, the piss ups, everything just, yeah, was for me massive on his first, first year after everything, the first six months just treated like he was to then getting a shot, training hard and keeping at it. And then they won it and he's never looked back and we're going into season six now. Um, and the, yeah, he's won three. So cool. Um, and won a European as well. So it just, yeah, the story for him, um, and that obviously helps me and the uh, helps me and my obviously not being able to be at home and do my follow my dream. Um, but I actually went back in 2020. So try to go back in 2020 and go for the next cycle and rang bunts and said, look, I love being a mom. I love being over here, but I'm really struggling. I want to come back. Um, and he said, yep, cool. You need to come back and play nationals. <laughs> and then in the December and then contracts January came back, flew back with my little girls by myself, um, played the nationals, got the contract, moved my, moved, pretty much over to the Mount, centralized with a family friend, my best friend's mum and dad, and lived there uh, January, February, March, because obviously Peter was established here now. He mm. was comfortable. He was training. He was in a good in a good um, routine. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go back. And he's like, well, where you go? Go give it a crack again. You want to go to you know, get a gold medal. So I uh, went back, um, trained my ass off again, got back in the team and the environment of the 20 contracted girls, and then COVID hit in March. Uh. 2020. Of course. <laughs> and I was like, uh, what? And I just remember Deb Anderson, who's the top dog doctor, um, when it all kind of started happening in the talks in that March. And obviously Peter was in France and everything was kind of hitting really quick over here and they were in lockdowns and stuff was happening really fast. And I'm like, oh, we're fine over here. And I remember her calling me being like, um, we all got sent back home um, for a week to see until things settled down. And she rang me and was like, Kayla, I think you need to get on a plane back to France because I think the world's going to shut down and there's going to be no Olympics. I was like, no, De- yeah. Debs, you're laughing. You're having a laugh. <laughs> and she was like, uh, no, they, I'm telling you now, I've, I talked to the, the government. I'm in talks with big dogs and I can tell you, and, you know, friend to friend, person to person, because she's, she's awesome. Um, you need to go back be with your family because the, the world's going to go into lockdown um, and there's going to be no Olympics. And I was like, okay. So within about three days, got on a flight. Uh, there was the repercharge ones yeah. with like the stuck French citizens in New Zealand, got on their free flight. And I managed to get on a Qatar flight uh, with the girls and I came back and France had done a four week lockdown and I got back in the second week, second lot of um, the four week lockdown. And it was probably the best time of my life because me and Peter and the girls were at home all day, every day, it was summer. We had my cousin was living with us. Some of the boys are living with us. And it just, mm. life stopped. And you just, yeah. looking back now, I'm like, it was crazy. But at that time, I was like, this is just what I needed. Just family time and having Peter around. And there's no Olympics. And then sure enough, there was no Olympics. And I was like, oh. And then it shifted to 21. And I was like, it's a lot. It's, it's sale. <laughs> it's gone, Gayla. It's gone. I was like, I can't. Um, it's not going to happen. So I, yeah, stopped that dream. And obviously, um, just happened. Obviously, they said it was going to be 2021. I said, oh, it's just too far for me because Bunce is like, you need to be here from the 1st of Jan. Um, and for me to go through that next year and then go back again, I was just like, oh, mm. my kids, it's just too much. So, turn that down. Um, but happy as Larry here because Peter's carving up, enjoying himself, playing great, great bunch of boys around him, just uh, an ep- living his best life. And for me, that's all, you know, that, that makes everything so much better. And the girls are happy here in school and I was happy with all the, the wags and our environment and, we, and our city's pretty cool. And then I was actually back in New Zealand when the Olympics happened uh, in Tokyo and I ended up jumping on um, Sky, the Sky uh, TV with Linda Atunu and commentated the girls' final. Um, and, yeah, I think when the when the whistle went and they won the gold, I was just like <laughs> – like a whole, I think Niall, Niall um, Williams was next door at the channel one or another channel um, at the time. And she was obviously, she'd been ruled out from a neck injury and she was like re- almost there, but missed out. So she was, you know, bawling for her reasons. And I was across the other one bawling, like just, but also a sense of pride for the girls. Cause you know, to get the gold is, you know, some of those girls worked there, have been there two cycles and it's just, yeah, the shit that the team had gone through, um, ups, downs, and, and the political stuff, and um, hard work, and to see them get the gold, especially. Um, sad for me in terms of I wanted to be there, but I'm just so happy they got that. Um, and for the nation, and then the you know girls aspiring to play rugby, and it's a bigger picture. So, yeah, tough, but awesome. Um, and I was obviously with Linda at the time. It was like, it's okay, Kay. Uh, but really. Um, and then, yeah, so... 
But I guess for me, being in France and following Peter's rugby and him doing so well has made it a lot easier. Um, yeah, in terms of it all. But it's been a juggle. Um, obviously, Sheree and Gillies are the other couple that I, you know, crack up at and give each other shit. And then that got, and then it gets worse because then the World Series decided to have two legs in Toulouse for two years. <laughs> so I was like, this is really salt in the wound. So again, like proud, but also like I want to be on the field right now. And yeah. everyone would give me shit. So they would come over and I would go to the jersey presentation and see all the girls, but really like, miss you all. <laughs> I just want to like, that was, um, the first year I was like, oh yeah, cool. Cause I, I think I was pregnant with Camille. Yeah. I was pregnant with uh, Sadie, the third one when they came over. So I was like, oh, you know, I can't jump on the field. You know, if there's an injury, they're all mocking me. But then last year they came and I, um, had Tyler, uh, Sheree and Stacey Walker come down and stay with me for a couple of days on their day off. And yeah. that was really hard because I was like, oh, I'm fit. I just want to jump on with you girls and play. And and it wasn't until that um, that tournament, Peter still gives me shit. I'm like, oh, cool, cool. And then the final, and then they're doing the hucker and the rain. And I like start crying. And I'm like, I obviously had a few wines in the stadium. And I'm like, he's like, what's wrong with you? And then Holly, Hicka Elliott's wife's like, just fucking leave her, Peter. <laughs> She's having a moment. Those are her sisters. I'm like, I just want to be on the field. And I was like, fuck you, Peter. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, he knows I've got a burning desire, but he's also, I think he understands that, you know, I've given a lot up to be here, but it's still, we're a family and I'm here to support him. And he, he's a bread, bread earner. So it's a no brainer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was last year was that was tough having them here and then also going to their trains and watching them and and then them yeah, being in the in the crowd. But from the on the other on the sidelines with my wine and the girls <laughs> and but then I took them out that night, had an awesome night in Toulouse with the men's and women's team and, and had a cool night out with them, which, you know, for Peter I think not a lot of people know from the sidelines, you're put in an environment with women people that you don't know you're forced to be friends with them forced to get along with them to an extent they're not 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 your people but it's a different kind of a different environment compared to when you're with your actual you know your mm. mates or your sisters or your family so when they came over that night i was remember saying to peter i was like you're not drinking this is my night these are my mates like you drink with your boys every weekend and get in on the purse and go out or whatever i was like these are my friends in town this is my night and he's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was like next minute all the other foreign boys are coming and I'm like, well, is this, is this all of us? Like, and all the girls are like, it's all good. And one, David Onu, um, the, one of the props, he's American Samoan and plays for America. His, uh, apartment's right in town. So we had like pre drinks at his apartment after the girls, you know, after they finished their awards night in Toulouse and had pre drinks there and then went to a bar and like, which one of, you know, Jew Machan owns, Jew, um, the French hooker, he owns a bar. And so we, we, it was really cool. Like just, and then all the other wags are here, like, oh, this is so nice seeing you with your actual, like, your people, Kayla. Like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I didn't realize until now you said it, but I haven't been so happy having them all here and just yeah. being around, you know, girls I wish I probably would still be with if um, yeah. you know, Peter was still playing in New Zealand. Um, and obviously that Moana, when that came to shape and we thought about coming back and him giving that another crack um, in the middle of our top 14 a couple of years ago, but – Mm. He's like, um, why would I leave this club? Like the money's good. The, I'm playing with the world's, the French, French internationals, um, and other internationals. I just didn't make sense for us to shift back for, yeah, for supers, which is pretty tough on the body, as you know. Like it's pretty, pretty demanding. Um, this competition, it's long. It's 11 months long with two comps, but I don't think the rugby's as, as quick and fast and physical as, as super rugby and, um, in that sense, in the training back there, that those, you know, very professional here, it's a bit different. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if Peter would be up just going from New Zealand, uh, from France back to New Zealand after having a, no, having no. a stint of it here. Fair enough. <laughs> He's killing so credit it. to boys that go from France back to New Zealand supers because it's a different, once you've had a taste of the French life and yeah, it's not easy. Um, so yeah, with that was on the cards for a bit and which meant I'd come back and play as well and uh, the Moana gig, but. It's um what was best for our family and his rugby and his body was was to be up here in, in France. So have you still got burning desires to play? It sounds like it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I I've even had the president of his team be like, you know, got to come play for us. I'm like, I can't speak French. And then I'm like, I've got I've got a kid, I've got another kid, and I just I just make excuses and find excuses. But I reckon if he was playing in England or Ireland, I'd probably still be playing. Oh, true. Um, just the language barrier is a, a big difference. Um. And the support network around and, you know, here I'd have it, but I don't want to rely on other partners mm. and wives to deal with my kids, you know, like it's just not the same. Um, 
And then I, in saying that, the games are all on Sundays and they travel away and I would miss Peter. And that's for him, it's me in the stands and his daughter's in the stands that, you know, get him up and stuff. So, yeah, I have thought about it, but I'm like, mm, if it's a couple of sevens tournaments, I've told them I'll maybe next, maybe this year or next summer, but uh, who knows? But yeah, um, I'm quite content where I'm at now, although, you know, it's not easy. Now I've got three little madams to deal yeah. with. I am quite, <laughs> quite busy. And this podcast of mine that's with Jada, quite busy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just seeing Peter excel and, and him, you know, enjoying rugby again after what was almost career ending and going back to club rugby, um, to see where he is today is pretty special. And, his body, like his, yeah, back, he had multiple shoulder, shoulder, sore knees and comes here and he's fine. Yeah. Had a couple of cleanups, but. What about your body? How, how yeah. much harder is it each time post baby to come back? <laughs> I had Taylor Johnson, um, Taylor and Maddie come across uh, a couple of weeks ago for the World Cup because they had FOMO and she just had a little boy and, um, Maddie Jr. and brought him over and she's like, I just don't know how you even. He's three months and I couldn't even, the thought of even running even, I said, no, you're, obviously I was pretty intense with Stella. I, I only put on like 10 kgs and I was neck level crazy. Um, but no, I, I don't see it as a problem. That's yeah. another reason why I, and especially why, cause girls mock and laugh because obviously Dice, Falia Funga come back and had twins. Um, she was in the sevens and then had twins with Tony Sher and then went back and, I think it was like a mantra that if Kayla can go and have a baby and come back, any of us can. <laughs> yeah. That was that was a thing for me because I wasn't the fittest, fastest, strongest. Like, and so for me to have a baby and come back, it was it was even more drive for me to be like, you girls can like mm. in a year have a baby and come back, come back after six months. Like, and also internationally as well, like some of the Aussie girls that were doing it, Alicia Quirk, Emily Cherry, like they were like, oh, it can be done. Mm. Um, so for me, I was like, it's just yeah, it's. Obviously, some people have horrific births and and whatnot, but um, if you, if everything's all good, I don't see it as as a as a problem or a, a blockage or a reason why you can't. Mm. So a lot of girls are on the scenes now having babies and coming back. A couple of girls in the English team, which is really cool to see that I follow and and they're back in there and being supported from the union, which is um, all I've ever wanted to see, which is really cool. Um, and then I bob bumped into Rob Nicol because Peter obviously did the World Cup for Tonga and bumped into him after the last game and um I was like I haven't seen you since I left and he's laughing he's like oh he, we had a few drinks each and I said oh well um when we come back to New Zealand I might need a job <laughs> <laughs> and he's like any day Kayla like oh because I gave him a few headaches when I was when I was there in that environment um it wasn't all grass and, and smelling yeah. flowers so he was you know put to work a bit with me but he's awesome so caught up with him and um went through a few memory lane with him about when I was back there and and obviously now seeing him seeing three of my daughters, which he was just like, we've got three kids and Peter's playing for Tonga. Like, what, what even is this? When I left, you were like, didn't know what was happening. I said, yeah, no, it's been six years now. So, Crazy. so that was quite, quite cool. And, uh, um, cool bump into him a couple of weeks ago or last month. So see how far yeah. we've actually come as a couple and as a family too. So, oh, it's so cool. And you're obviously trailblazing in terms of like, um, a woman athlete having a baby and getting back to the sport and something that like obviously us males um definitely take for granted like <laughs> the prime years of your playing career are obviously your prime baby producing years as well so it's a it's a huge commitment to be able to juggle that and yeah. um you doing that i'm sure so many different women female athletes have got heaps out of um seeing you do it and true inspiration Hope so. That's why I'm telling Tyler to hurry up, but she's she's still still waiting for your baby, Tyler. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's been cool, um, and it's not forever. This journey, I guess, um, for Peter's career and any any career in sport, it's not forever. So I know we'll go home soon and back to semi reality, a different reality for us. So yeah, living it up over here as much as possible, missing our family every day, which is probably the hardest, um, yeah. especially for me. I don't have a, a village. We have a little village, you know, we're quite lucky in Toulouse. If people know that the foreign group here is really cool. Joe, Joe and Helen to Corey have just, another reason why we've been so well looked after here is they've always pushed for foreign and French to kind of be together. And um, obviously Charlie and Michelle Farmoina were massive for us too. So we came at a really good time. Jerome, Di, Charlie, Charles and Joe, and Helen. Um, so in the last five years, we've been pretty, pretty well looked after in terms of the island culture and our, you know, vill village away from our big village. So I don't think we would have got this experience anywhere else. So we've, um, 
literally hit jackpot coming to Toulouse where Luke was, um, where my cousin is also here playing, who loved, you know, my little girl's love. And then obviously the, the foreigners we have here are really, really cool, cool group. So very, very lucky, yeah. um, but it's not forever. So uh, we are renegotiating right now. So who knows what – right now we're in that moment where I don't know what's happening next year. <laughs> Again, yeah. The bloody... <laughs> Two-year cycle. <laughs> Two-year cycle is happening right now. So I'm like, um, yeah, don't know. But, you know, it is what it is. I've learned over the last couple of years to just roll with it, go with it since COVID really. Um, mm. And, it, you know, everything happens for a reason. So it, it's going with it and the girls are good. So yeah, The way Peter's going, I'd imagine it'd be hard to see you guys leaving there until he's fully done, like he's yeah. been on fire. <laughs> Don't know. So, I, you know, the market's pretty pretty strong over here at the moment, obviously with the English teams going under. Um, as you'd know, a lot of English boys are jumping across here as well and so the market is pretty tough. Um, mm. And when you hit over 30 in France, they think you're old. So um, Luke would know that. <laughs> I mean, Corey <laughs> and some of the boys, you know, like, yeah. The age thing is big here. I don't know why, but so yeah, it's it's an interesting times at the moment, which you know comes in every two or three years. Yeah. Um, so we're in that now, but you know we're we're comfortable. Whatever happens, happens. Um, you know, he's accomplished a lot being here in five years, improved himself and his family and and the people here um, that were there that first year. Um, so no, it's won championships. So he's happy and. Yeah. Um, but it is, at the end of the day, a, a job that is special, uh, the salary in terms of, you know, making the most of it when you, you know, as much as you can. Um, but if we come home, I probably will be going into a full-time job and I cannot wait to get back to work, which I know a lot of people would never think we'd say, but I'm like, I need to work. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy. I'm ready yeah. when it happens. Um, but for you boys, it's another whole, you know, that life after rugby is another whole conversation. Um, yeah pretty scary um some for some boys and the unknown but for me i can't wait to get back into work <laughs> and, well you've got a job with the rpa you're, you're oh, ready to yeah, go yeah hey rob rob's got me a job um <laughs> but yeah so but for obviously peter it's an unknown area that will be our next um when that when that comes to it and obviously charlie and rochelle from we have just finished up here and kind of got some guidance from them and watching what they're you know their transitional phase so yeah, it just it's different for everyone. So I don't know, um, but that's what we're kind of we're dealing with soon in the next couple of years. Yeah. If not now, I don't know. So oh, exciting times! Exciting times for the Aki family. Then what a journey! What a journey you guys have been on. It's incredible over the past six years or even cool. before that. It's been um, yeah. some journey. But we have gone to the Instagram for some questions. So I'll quickly run through a few of these. Um, I know it's late over there in France, no, but we'll first go. one: Who wins? Run it straight, you or Peter? Run it straight. Oh, well, I, I need a bit of movement, so he'll win because it's running it straight. <laughs> I don't run it straight, so definitely Peter. Cause About he one runs, on one. No, he runs it straight. I don't run it straight. I, I get away. I, I go away from contact. He actually runs it straight, so Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be able to, you'd be able to step him, though? Or maybe. So if I have a couple of no, maybe. Yeah, you've few, got him. Moments on the five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Advice you'd give young ladies to stay hungry? Um. Hungry for food or hungry for like <laughs> rugby? <laughs> oh, I just, yeah, um, it's the training, the work ethic behind the scenes that no one's watching for me. If I've learned anything, um, you know, doing the, the little one percenters that people call it now, um, eating right, training. Obviously, the social scene for me is a different one, but, you know, ch choosing when and when not to um, doesn't mean getting on the piss every weekend, but choose your moments. Um, but the, not sacrifice, but more of a choice and a different lifestyle. But yeah, just have a goal, write it down, um, work towards it. Um, and if you get knocked back in terms of selection, just keep going back. Don't just give up and change something else. Just keep going and yeah, it'll, it'll happen. But yeah, it's the little one percenters for me that wish I had, I wish I had done, um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, a little bit better. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that is good advice for any young, not just women athletes, but, um, any, any athlete. Okay, next one. How did her mindset slash outlook change towards sport once she had had her first beautiful girl? Oh, it's a whole different reason for doing something. So I was like, you have a purpose um, that – like, I don't know. I just – yeah, this is a really – this is like a feeling one. I can't even explain it. Um, but when I went back to my first tournament for Dubai, my whole outlook was different. Um, who I was playing for, she was on the sideline – um, sometimes I, there'd be a, some, chase someone down, for example, and I'd be like, oh, you know, let them score and we'll just get it back another try. I would chase him down because I'm just like, so yeah, it, 
um, gives you a lot more appreciation and it's half of you. Like it's something you've made. Um, really hard to explain until you experience it yourself, but gives you more motivation. Um, and yeah, I did work a little bit harder, a, a lot harder um, and had to. And I guess you have someone to rely on you and you want to make someone more prouder. I've got my mum and dad and my family and my husband, but when it's a child, um, you do everything to make sure that when they look back or can look back at you that, you know, you've made them proud. So sense of a bit of responsibility, but yeah, it was a different motivation to what I've normally had. Mm. Motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense like that. Okay. Next one. Who would you often go to for advice? Obviously you had a um, few options with Peter, Luke and um, oh, the old man. Actually, I will just tell a story after you, Charlie Mack, for people that know my dad is, um, yeah, one of, you know, he's obviously a coach, a player, a dad, a granddad. But for me, for four years and now playing the sport that he's you know, wanted me to play since day dot, I will come off a match, off a game. So this, And also my mum has her five cents too because she's really supportive and Luke, Luke knows that too because <laughs> dad was really tough on Luke and mum was always a positive one. I would come off games and I'd have a text from Luke, my dad, and Peter. Luke's one would be like, good, good work, good game, let's say, like awesome, doing really well. Dad would be like, you need to work on this, this, and this in the next game. <laughs> and then Peter's was like a bit of in between, like you did really well, but just focus on this. <laughs> I had three different angles, and sometimes I wouldn't even go to my phone after a game. I'd just be like, in the next block for four hours, I'm just gonna, like, I just know it's coming. Um, but then when I was on the, the struggling side of selection, injuries, um, literally those three, and my mum. Yeah. Um, yeah, mum, dad, Peter, and um, mum for for moral support. But yeah, it was usually dad because yeah. I I I would I wouldn't hear what I want to hear from my dad. I'd hear what I need to hear. Um, yeah. Luke's a little bit more cautious because he's obviously had dad and knows what it's like the feeling of being you know told some things. And then obviously Peter tries to be level. So yeah, <laughs> dad. Although we we butt heads and we clash, as people would know. But usually I'd. After a few hours, I get over it. But yeah, dad. All three angles. How good's that? You're yeah. getting you're getting all yeah. the advice, and you could pick and choose depending on how you're feeling. Hey, mum, don't worry about mum. Mum will give you her advice too. You know, use your fan, do this, do that. I'm like, does you know? So mum never, and my mum as well. So she was, you know, and there was she. She is a sideline ref. Or yell like she's just. She knows just as much of the game as as probably the ref. Oh, so my mum too. Good stuff. Okay, next one. Um, did you ever consider a sponsorship with Mitre? Oh, say to Luke's Mitre boots. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the money was good, then I'd probably say yes. But they made personalized boots for Luke when he was there. But uh, no, when I was there, I didn't get offer. I think in my era, a couple, you know, there was not really individual sponsors. It kind of happened when, as I left after Rio, yeah. the individual sponsors were coming in. The NZIU were more open to the girls having individual sponsors and conflicting sponsors. Um, but when I was there, it wasn't really happening. Um, and if it was, it wasn't really me unless it brought in a big chunk of money. Um, I wasn't, I was focused, but no, if Mida came knocking now, you know, if they've just stay in still anything, available, anything, yeah. yeah, not too it, late, take it, <laughs> never say no. Okay, there you go, Mida, relaunch that <laughs> boot project. Um, <laughs> Okay, next one. What is the McAllister quad routine? What was the McAllister quad routine growing up? Nothing. It's just genetics from my granddad Charlie. Is it? So my dad's my dad's dad. Um, my granddad has got calves that can't fit into gum boots and the freezing works <laughs> in the necky. And um, yeah, I yeah I don't know. I think Luke would tell you the same. It just it's genetics um, for us. Um, yeah, I didn't do quad workouts or in the gym or anything, if that's what they're asking. Yeah. But if anything, <laughs> probably calf raises to help with, you know, ankles and ankles. But no, nah, it's a genetics from my granddad, granddad Charlie, who's still alive today, um, down in the necky. Um, but he's got lots of stories and one of them is his calf's not fitting in his work boots. So <laughs> genetics. Man, <laughs> genetics. What people would do to get those genetics in their quads and calves. Oh, not even having to lift and getting quads like that. Oh, Incredible. Oh, no. Shut up. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are the challenges unique to females in sports other than dollars? Probably the support. Obviously, the the bums on seats at, in, in, in stadiums, um, like big games. Oh, if you're talking about sevens, um, 15s, I'm probably speaking more for the 15s game. Yeah. Um, for me, seeing the Women's World Cup, I actually had a group of French women come to me and ask for advice going to New Zealand to watch the World Cup and follow the French girls. 
And I literally said, I'm really sorry, but I don't know if the crowds are going to be any good. <laughs> I just said, look, I'm telling you now, um, going from the French crowd that has hissing crowds at club level, yeah. I basically, out of really embarrassing, I kind of said, look, you're not, you know, maybe in between games, go and travel around New Zealand, which they did. But I said, look, you're not going to get much of crowds and it's just women's, you know, rugby and just rugby in New Zealand at the moment. It's in a bit of a, and wow, I totally <laughs> got put on back, shut down. Um, yeah. The crowds were unreal. They came back and had the time of their life. Um, these French, this French family and two, two women were just like, it was the best ever. Like, and the girls won it, obviously, of the French didn't, but the, our girls won it. So for me, you know, it's the getting the top, top games and obviously the World 15's coming now. So they're making changes and making it just those barriers trying to be on par with the men's side, which never will be the same because it's, you know, it's new and it's, it's evolving, but more, more games, more tournaments. Um, and the sevens, I mean, sevens is pretty good at the moment. It's world circuit Olympics, com games. So they're going pretty well. Com game. Yeah. But for me, it's a 15 side that I want, you know, I've seen a big push in the last five years, um, which is really cool. Contracting. and music. So it's a pathway for girls, not just sevens, also black ferns. Um, so that's massive. I came back home recently this in June and caught up with Carla and Hoodie and Alexis Tapsall and just spoke about how the, you know, the game is growing and it is a pathway now from, yeah, uh, 15 wasn't really paid. It was kind of like a half, half pie thing and it was fucking frustrating because to be the best, you need to be able to train like the best and yeah. they were having to hold down jobs and had all this, you know, I kind of knew because we did the sevens and, you just can't do it. It's just, there's not enough time in the day and you're not getting your sleep. You're not getting, you know, your recovery. So to see that game in the 15s change for our, for the Black Ferns was really special. Um, they're making movements and the NZRU coming to the party and, and Alan Bunting and, and obviously how winning the World Cup's made a massive change, make, make mm. changes. So yeah, it's more the big games, big tournaments and, um, the, f- the structure around back home, they're being full time athletes like the men. Yeah, no, it has been awesome to see. Eh? like that World Cup was. Yeah. I think everyone was surprised with the numbers. Like it was incredible, and New Zealand got right behind yeah. it, and um, and the flow and effect has been awesome. And now seeing it yeah. becoming more and more professional, more and more full time, it's um, so cool for the for the women's game. It's only going to grow the whole game and in the overall yeah. scheme of things. Okay, last question. Best piece of advice you have for a Waddle Ad listener? Love finishing with this and jeepers, you've given it's some advice. good stuff. Yeah, you're full of advice. Follow Life from the Sidelines with Kayla and Jada. <laughs> 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 nah, um, oh, I don't even, I just, I think since COVID, my whole outlook's changed and just live every day um, as it comes and obviously with what's happening in the world as well with, with the war and, and all that yeah. as well. It's just, it's horrific, you know, it's crazy times. Um, but just, yeah, tell your loved ones, you love them every day. Um, take every day as it comes, which is, you know, at the moment for my mantra and for Peter and our family and, you know, the future, who knows, but um, yeah, just love your family, love the ones you love and keep in contact with them. And ones who are in the sporting avenue, just keep training hard or working hard. Um, but yeah, for me, family's everything. So um, just telling my checking with loved ones and yeah, best advice, just live every day as it comes. Oh, talking shit. No, that, <laughs> that, that is. Wine. If, <laughs> if you made that up, that is incredible because that is powerful. It's I could feel all the emotion and it's obviously how you live. Like um, you've had to bit, go through a fair bit throughout your career. Obviously, um, very successful career yourself, and then having to. You know, juggle that with supporting your husband and having children and um, all this uncertainty of where you're going to live, where you're going to be, what's next. Um, It's not easy, but um, it's been so cool to hear how you've managed to get through it all and how you're so happy now over there. And seeing Peter do so well on the big stage has been um, awesome to see as well. So um, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. And like you said, make sure if you are listening to this, um, go go follow life on the sidelines and the girls and the girls yeah get more girls on 100 that is that what is the lad. goal but really appreciate you coming on <laughs> cool thanks jimmy that was cool and um have you done any more pranks late, lately because i didn't add in there um <laughs> your how i first knew who you were is because you pranked peter with pitipa and to this day it's still we, we show people on youtube um over here um and actually, so Jada as well. I said, this guy, actually, I don't know if I want to go on there because he's going to prank me. Um, but he, she listened to him and was like, oh, my God. You were, oh, I should have got you with a pit of it. So, 
like, fond memories of knowing who you were in the Hurricanes because you got Oh, it was one of my favourites, that one, just because it was so, like, low-key about it. But. Huh? <laughs> Half price for having his best mate, I think it was. <laughs> oh, oh, good times. Uh, appreciate you coming on. Thank you.